Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Summer and I'm 14 years old and in year eight. I'm lucky enough to be part of this Kids for Nature webinar, along with some special guests and other kids hosts that I will introduce soon. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we meet on today. I myself live on Jabberwong country, but of course there are people from all over Victoria, Australia, and even some international guests. So I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are here today. Benji, Hugo and Molly will be presenting today, will be hosting this webinar with me today. Today we will be featuring an endangered frog from Melbourne Museum and an amazing pygmy possum from Zoo's Victoria that lives up in the snow covered Alps as well as Uncle David, a Wurundjeri elder, who will talk to us about Aboriginal culture. Trust for Nature is a wonderful organisation that helps protect threatened animals and plants on private property. By protecting habitat, Trust for Nature ensures safe homes for wildlife. Lots of threatened species occur on private land outside national parks. My dad works for Trust for Nature in Southwest Victoria. He teaches me and my sister a lot about animals and plants that we get a privilege of seeing each day on our continent. It's always fun trying to practice the plant's scientific names. We also learn lots about animals and what they do in their daily lives. Our first speaker is Bridget Bell. She works for Melbourne Museum and looks after live animals. She will be showing us the growling grass frog. One of the reasons why they are so special is because they are so endangered. Growling grass frogs eat other frogs and also their call sounds a bit like a motorbike. Isn't that interesting? Also, if anyone has any questions throughout today's webinar, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. This only really applies to people who are watching our Zoom Live and not from YouTube. You can type away your questions and we will endeavour to answer them. Now I would like to hand over to Bridget to tell us about this most interesting frog. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, if I could just get like a thumbs up from someone <laughs> to let, the, let me know that you can hear me, that'd be great. Awesome, thank you. Um, so you might be able to hear in the background, um, I'm actually here at the museum. I'm part of the live exhibits team here at Melbourne Museum. So our job basically is to look after the live animals that we have here. And if you visited the museum before, you may have visited our forest gallery, which is where I'm standing right now. Um, so we have a lot of native species uh, that actually live out here. And yeah, my job is to look after them. But um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about the growling grass frog. Um, I'm standing in front of their enclosure here, which is in the forest gallery. So when the museum finally opens back up and you can come and visit us, you can actually come and see this amazing endangered species here at um, Melbourne Museum. So I'm going to talk about the growling grass frog and I've actually got one here. If I could show you a bit of a closer. Mm. So as you can see, there are pretty big species of frog. Um, they are called, called a growling grass frog, like Summer said, um, because of the sound they make. So the males, they will make that sound. Um, the females actually don't make a sound. Um, the reason they're endangered is because they used to be found all over Victoria and um, quite common here in Melbourne as well. But as more housing estate has come up um, and Melbourne's getting bigger and bigger, the population, um, the amount of habitat that these frogs have has um, diminished. So yeah, if they don't have somewhere to live, they can't really survive. So that's the reason why they're struggling at the moment. Um, so yeah, we're really lucky to have this species here at the museum and you guys are really lucky that you can come and see them. Um, if I, again, show you this guy, <laughs> these uh, frogs, they can range from, if you do see one uh, out in, you know, in the waterways around Melbourne, they can range from this brown color, as you can see here, um, all the way kind of to a bright green as well. Um, so yeah. You know, grass frog, they should be green, but this guy's here is a bit brown at the moment. Um, you can see that I'm actually wearing gloves to hold this frog. Oh, he just made a noise. I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> you can see I'm wearing gloves to hold frogs. Um, so the reason I'm wearing gloves is because frogs have very sensitive skin and they um, actually, yeah, can 
our um, toxins on our skin can actually hurt them and damage them and um, hurt their sensitive skin. So um, if you see a frog in the wild, it's best not to pick it up because you may, um, <laughs> it's making noises for me, you may um, accidentally hurt it if, um, even though you're not meaning to. So yeah, the safest way to hold it um, without damaging their um, you know, sensitive skin is to wear gloves. Um, what else can I tell you about the growling grass frog? Usually the females are a lot bigger than the males. <laughs> um, so, and this one is um, probably a male because it's calling right now. Um, the males during breeding season, they'll actually, they'll get on their thumbs a really dark little pad and it'll get kind of grippy. So that's so they can hold on to the girls during breeding season. Um, so that's another way you can tell the males from the females. Um, as I said, the color kind of different, differentiates depending on the light. So um, more light, more, you know, unfiltered sunlight, they're gonna be a bright green color. Whereas um, these guys are under, they do get a bit of natural light here, but they're mainly under um, a UV bulb. So they're getting more of, um, yeah, artificial light. <laughs> um, so frogs, obviously, they depend really um, heavily on waterways to breed. Um, so with, as I mentioned before, you know, urbanization around Melbourne um, are diminishing the amount of waterways there is around. So frogs, they need waterways to breed and reproduce um, because obviously the babies of frogs are tadpoles and they need water to survive. So yeah, <laughs> has that been 10 minutes? Let me check. Wow. Thank you so <laughs> much, Bridget. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah, that but was... any questions you have, I'm happy to answer any questions. That was amazing. <laughs> I'm here with Benji. Hi, Did you Benji. Love that talk? <laughs> how, old, how old are you, Benji? Five. 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 And what did you what was the coolest fact you just learned about growling grass frogs? They do. I don't know if you can hear this one now. Man, <laughs> and we can see so clearly, and he looks so cool. Thank you so much, Bridget, for sharing your your beautiful growling grass frogs with us from the Melbourne Museum. My pleasure. And yeah, please come visit us when the museum opens again. Um, we're really looking forward to having people back. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Bridget. Okay, Benji, who's up next? Rebecca. Rebecca. Talking about mountain pygmy possums. Talking about mountain pygmy possums. And Benji, what do you think mountain pygmy possums eat? Moths. Moths? Let's find out and see if we're right. Over to you, Rebecca. Well done, Benji. You are amazing. Good job. And yes, you are right. Mountain pygmy possums do eat moths. And I'm going to tell you a lot more about them now. So uh, my name's Beck. I work at Hillsville Sanctuary for Zoos Victoria. I'm just going to share my screen now because I've got something to show you all. Okay, hopefully you can see that now. Can I get a thumbs up from somebody that everyone can see that and hear everything okay? Yeah, awesome, thank you. So a big welcome from Hillsville Sanctuary, Woman Jika, everybody. So today I'm gonna to be focusing on this absolutely adorable, tiny little possum called the Mountain Pygmy Possum. And you can see, uh, this is William on the screen there. He's one of our Mountain Pygmy Possums we have at Hillsville Sanctuary, isn't he absolutely adorable? <laughs> So I'll just start by sharing our fighting extinction story and what we're about at Zoos Victoria. So our vision at Zoos Victoria is to fight extinction to help secure a future rich in wildlife. And you can see we've got our little mountain pygmy possum there. Our vision and our mission is to be the world's uh, best zoo-based conservation or uh, leading zoo-based conservation organisation. And at the moment, we've got 27 local threatened species that we're working really hard to try and save. And there are a lot of people, a lot of resources that go into helping to save these species. We work with lots of different partners across the world and across Australia to help save these animals. But there's 27 at the moment that we're focusing on and each one of these species has its, faces its own threats and risks in the wild and actually needs our help to help save them. 
But today, and you, you might even know some of these already, I know, I know most of you will know some of these. Today we're focusing on the beautiful mountain pygmy possum and you can see it there on your screen. So these little guys are actually found up high up in the Alpine mountains. They're Australia's only hibernating marsupial, which is pretty crazy to think that a tiny little marsupial would live up in the freezing cold temperatures of the Alpine mountains in Australia. So they're found in the Alpine zones of New South Wales and Victoria, and that includes Mount Buller, Mount Hotham and Mount Kosciuszko. And up there, they like to live underneath the boulder fields. So you can see there's a tiny little mountain pygmy possum down on the bottom of your screen. They like to live under these boulders and the, the snow that forms on top of these boulders helps to insulate them during winter. So they have lots of tunnels and little, kind of like super highways underneath all these boulders that they use to get around and to find food and also to travel to breed as well. So the males will often travel higher up, higher altitudes to find the females for breeding. Now let's have a closer look at these beautiful little possums because I'm sure you're wondering what they, what they look like and how they survive in their habitat. So I'm going to show you a quick video now of these beautiful little marsupials just to see what you think. Are you ready? I'll stop sharing my screen and share something else. Here we go. All right, I hope you love them as much as I do. What did you think everybody? How gorgeous are they? So you're probably wondering why are mountain pygmy possums so special? And you would have noticed a few of these amazing features that they have in that video just then. There are some pretty amazing features and behaviours that mountain pygmy possums use to help them survive up in those freezing cold temperatures of the Australian, Australian Alps. So one of the things they do is they actually like to because it gets so cold, they hibernate for up to seven months of the year. So they spend around half of the year sleeping. And I'm sure some of you would like to do that yourself. It'd be pretty cool to be a mountain pygmy possum to sleep for that long. So they actually hibernate for seven months of the year. They make a nice, cozy, mossy nest underneath the boulders. And then they curl up in that nest, curl up into a ball and, and sleep for those seven months. So hibernation. They also have really big eyes to help them see at night time because they are nocturnal. And I noticed one of those questions came through early on. So that answers that one. They are nocturnal. Really big ears as well to help them see at night time, help them hear at night time. So big eyes, big ears to listen out for predators. And also they have a prehensile tail, which means it's like an extra limb. It helps them to grip onto branches and helps them to move around trees to collect food and that sort of thing. So it provides it's an extra feature that helps them to survive up in those plants that they, where they need to collect food from as well. And it does have some pretty cool behaviors that it uses to survive. We talked about how it makes a mossy nest and hibernates. And you'll see in that second picture there, it curls itself up into a little ball. So it tucks its little nose into its tummy and curls up into a little ball to conserve all that heat inside and, and actually try and keep it warm during winter. They also need snow. They need, a, um, they need to live in a place that has a continuous snow cover for up to six months. So that's why they're found in those really cold areas because that snow actually provides an insulating layer on top of the boulders, which keeps them asleep during those winter months. And did anybody notice in the video they're at a type of food source that they might use and might depend on up there. You might have noticed 
those big bogong moths. So they are their main food source up in the Alpine mountains. They're really big um, and, and full of protein. So they're really fat and juicy and full of protein and provide lots of food for them when they come out of hibernation and before hibernation. They help to fatten them up again, ready to go into hibernation and also for breeding too. Now the life cycle of a mountain pygmy possum is quite quick. So when they breed, the males will actually uh, travel higher up the mountains to get to the females to breed. And the female will only be pregnant for about 13 days. How quick is that? It's very, very fast. She will usually have, so she's pregnant for around 13 days and then she gives birth to around a litter, which is a group of um, mountain pygmy possums, a litter of about three to four joeys. Now she is a marsupial, which means, does anyone know what that means? She has a pouch. So she has a pouch to keep her tiny little joeys in. And those joeys are the size of a Tic Tac or a grain of rice, about the size of your little fingernail. If you have a look at that, it's pretty small. They stay in the pouch for around four to five weeks. And then they come out of the pouch and they drink, they're drinking mum's milk while they're in the pouch. They come out of the pouch and for another four to five weeks, they stay drinking mum's milk. But after that, so after around two months, two to three months, they then leave, they start to explore outside the nest and then they will leave their mum. So you can see we've got Plum down the bottom there. She was one of our mountain pygmy possums in our captive breeding program at Hillsville Sanctuary. And she had four babies last year, which was absolutely beautiful and very exciting for us. And then after those babies have dispersed, they become independent and they're fully grown by about two years. They only live for about two to three years, but the oldest mountain pygmy possum we found in the wild was around 12 years. So that's pretty amazing too. And you're probably wondering what the threats to mountain pygmy possums are. So they are critically endangered. There are less than 2000 left in the wild and they face a number of threats, which is why we need your help to raise awareness of them and help to save them too. So they're, due, um, they're critically endangered due to habitat loss because there are a lot of ski resorts and roads that are impacting on the, the plants that are surviving up there and also the boulder fields that they live in too. So habitat loss is a big one. They are also um, facing threats from predators, introduced species such as foxes and cats and climate change. So climate change causes drought. It also causes the temperatures to warm up which means that sometimes they can come out of hibernation earlier if there's not enough snow cover and those temperatures are warming. And also things like fire. Big events like fire can wipe out plants in their habitat. It can wipe out, make them more um, visible to predators when they're moving around. And because of climate change and warming temperatures, we've also seen a decrease in the number numbers of moths that are arriving up there. Now moths migrate up to the alpine areas each spring and usually there's around 4,000 moths per, uh, per season. And these mountain pygmy possums come out of hibernation and actually rely on these little moths as their main food source. So because of the drought, because that's actually affecting um, a lot of the moth numbers and also a lot of light pollution from urban areas is actually distracting the moths on their way up to, those, to the Alpine mountains. But, there's, there's not, no need to lose help because we've got lots of ways that we are helping these beautiful possums. So Zoos Victoria and our partners, our Mountain Pygmy Possum Recovery Team, are actually helping to combat a lot of these threats and putting lots of resources into helping to save this beautiful little marsupial. We've created tunnels of love, which are pretty cool. So these tunnels actually go, so a lot of the time the males have to cross really busy alpine roads to get to higher altitudes for the, the female possums. And a lot of them were getting predated on by foxes and, and cats and also hit by cars and um, that was impacting them a lot. So what Zoos Victoria and the Mountain Pygmy Possum Recovery Team have done is built tunnels of love underneath the roads to allow the moths to get safely from lower up to higher up to breed which is and move around to find different habitat as well which is very very exciting and they're called tunnels of love because they're used during the breeding season and there's a couple of these there's one at Mount Hotham and one at Mount Buller as well and they've been really really effective we also track we've got little cameras in there that track which mountain pygmy possums are moving in between the tunnels and what times of the year as well 
We're also breeding these beautiful little marsupials um, in captivity at Zoos Victoria and then releasing them back into the wild to help their population. And because of the declining moth number, numbers up there at the moment, we've actually come up with something called a bogong bicky, <laughs> which is actually a little biscuit made of mealworms, oils, nuts and protein, which we are using in special feeders up there at the moment to help, um, to help give them a food source because there's not enough moths at the moment. And they're actually really enjoying them too. And we found a lot of those bogong bickies came in really helpful really handy after the fires this year too, to help provide extra food source for those populations in New South Wales as well. So you're probably wondering how you can help. There is something that you can do to help these beautiful little possums. And I'm going to show you a really quick animation about something really simple that you can do at home to help these beautiful animals. So you would have noticed the main action that you can take to help save these beautiful little possums is to switch off any outdoor lights. So during spring, so we're in spring at the moment, so from about September to December, you can actually switch off your outdoor lights to help those moths get straight up to the mountains as a food source for the mountain pygmy possums. City lights can actually distract the moths from their migration path and cause them to stop along the way at places they probably shouldn't be when they should be going straight towards the mountain. So by flicking off your outdoor lights, that's gonna help our mountain pygmy possums and all those moths are going to be able to be directed um, by the light of the moon and the stars to get back up to the mountains and not become confused. And also, if you want to help us track bogong moths, because we're wondering where are they stopping along the way? Are there main areas that they are diverting to and stopping that's preventing them from getting up to the Alpine mountains. So you can actually help us by tracking, if you see, by tracking the moths. So if you see a bogong moth near your home, you can go to this website down the bottom, which is www.swift.net.au moth tracker. And all you need to do is put, put your name in, take a photo of the moth, upload it and put your location. And this is going to help Zoos Victoria to work out where the moths are going along the way and why they're not arriving at the mountains where they should be for that main source of food for the mountain pygmy possums. So pretty simple and we're really looking forward to seeing some of your moth sightings along the way. The other really simple thing that you can do to help this beautiful animal is to just raise awareness. Just tell the story of the mountain pygmy possum to your friends and family. So tell your friends, neighbours, your family, your school, your teachers, your principal, tell them all how special this beautiful little possum is and help spread the love for this beautiful animal. So we've had lots of schools create puppet shows, they've created posters, pamphlets, one school even created a little card, swap card game that they were selling at markets and things like that. Anything that you can do to just raise the profile of this species and get people thinking about how special it is. We've also got totes for wildlife, which are on our website. And that's just by purchase, purchasing a tote bag, you can actually help to raise money to plant plants and certain species of plants that mountain pygmy possums eat up in the Alpine areas as an extra food source for them. So that's all the proceeds for that go to helping save endangered species. 
And I just want to say a big thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope you've fallen in love with the mountain pig and possum as much as we do at Zoos Victoria. And hopefully you'll get to see more about this species in the future and the amazing recovery that it's making. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, my name is Hugo. I am nine years old and in grade four. My mum works for Trust for Nature, helping to make our laws for nature stronger. Rebecca, I loved hearing about mountain pygmy possums. It was so great. I especially loved the fact about how mountain pygmy possums hibernate under boulders in the snow and eat bogon moths. Also, that newborn joeys is as small as a, as a tic tac. Here is another interesting fact involving sweet things. Did you know a fully grown pygmy possum can weigh as little as two marshmallows? On the other end of the size spectrum, Australia used to be full of megafauna, including marsupials like the Diprotodon. Tell me ages to learn that name. It looked to, looks a bit like today's rhinoceros, but without the horn, and it weighed 2.8 tons more than an adult giraffe. I couldn't even count how many marshmallows that would be. I think it is really important that we protect nature so all, all our amazing animals and plants like the pygmy possum can survive happily alongside us into the future. Is, there is no planet B. It is now time to introduce our third speaker, Uncle Dave, who is a Wurundjeri elder and is coming to us live from on country. I can't wait to hear what he has to say. On to you, Dave. Thank you, Hugo. And that's wonderful to hear at your young age that you are learning so much about our natural world instead of the world that we are sometimes choose to live in, which is about living in a house and a tablet and fresh water coming out of the tap without realizing where it all comes from. And this is the very important part about being able to understand that when you are out on country that you respect and understand what it is. And our previous presenters and also our introducers, our panellists, have actually pointed out things that even I'm still learning from today. The little mountain pygmy possum. I've heard about him. I didn't know some of the things that I just learned. So even though I'm an elder of the Wurundjeri Tribe Land Council, and I have a little bit of area where I'm standing today that I care for, and I understand that there are animals here, and there are fish, and there are insects, and there are snakes, there are grasses, there are trees, and they're all fascinating things. But what we haven't really done yet, much as I, must, I respect all the work that's done for our threatened species, and that needs to continue, but it needs to feed in to the ones that are not yet threatened, but are looking in the future that will become threatened. And this is where we understand what I'm going to try and teach you today about Aboriginal culture is that we've always known what we call the circle of knowledge. And a circle is only a circle so long as it has equal pressures from inside the circle and outside the circle. As soon as you relieve the pressure, the circle starts to collapse. Just like if you have a balloon and you put a pinprick in it, it collapses on you. And this is what has been happening, not only in Australia, but all around the world due to the impacts of industrialization, uh, of modernization, but also climate change, which has been caused by these effects, that there are little pinpricks happening in all the little balloons and all the little ecosystems that exist in the patches of land where you might be living. And we need to be very careful about how we reconstruct that circle, that it doesn't get too big in one place and too small in another, remembering that all things are connected. I'm down here talking on country, and I'm gonna turn my camera around now so you don't have to look at me. There we go. I'm standing here, and I only discovered this tree has fallen down recently in storms that have happened a couple of weeks ago. And I'm standing here on Wurundjeri country, in Hillsville, not very far away from the Hillsville Sanctuary. And I've had the privilege of being able to work behind the scenes with Hillsville Sanctuary on preservation of a couple of other threatened species, which is the helmeted honey eater, which is our bird, uh, Victorian state emblem of the bird. And also 
again, in line with the possums, the lowland leadbeater's possum, which we do know from historical records used to occur on the land where I am standing now. Hasn't been seen for a long time because it's been cleared for agriculture, but we are doing, as Aboriginal people of land on which we own, we are working closely together with the state government and with the various museums, the sanctuaries, and lots of other volunteers to create a space where hopefully backing up Hills Hill Sanctuaries Threatened Species Program that one day those animals can be released here and we know that they will be able to, be, to survive. Although we are here in spring and everything looks beautiful and green, especially down here where I'm looking at our little creek that's running through, when I think about Indigenous culture and Indigenous history, this little creek, when I was a young child, still at primary school, my father used to bring me here and he taught me how to fish. And we caught eels and we caught blackfish, but we also caught yabbies and freshwater crays. Now, these are not a threatened species, but they are now in low numbers. If I bring my grandchildren here today and teach them how to fish, I would might have to sit here for two to three days to catch one of those fish that myself and my father used to catch quite often. And that makes us sad that we did not understand the impacts of what people living on country, building roads, building houses, factories, where does all our waste products go? And of course, most of it was is used and still is today used to go into our creeks. So if you go back to our original growling grass frog, when you hear the name grass frog, you understand that it lives in the grasses. That's what you would think from hearing it. But they actually do need very, very fresh water. They need particular types of water that flows a certain way. And it also needs to be actually sitting there at the right time for when they want to breed. And they are beautiful. The sound of that one frog is fantastic. But when you come across a group of them and they're all singing together, it is an absolutely privilege to hear. It's like an orchestra or it's like your favorite rap song that you might listen to today. And if you take the time to go out in nature and you don't need to be Aboriginal, you just need to be a person who cares to go out and listen. Not only listen, but use your eyes to see, your ears to hear, your nose to smell, your fingers to touch, and sometimes when you know the land that you are walking on, to actually use your tongue to taste. We were given these senses by our creators, whoever your creator may be, whatever religion you might be. For us, of course, it's Bunjil the Wedge Tailed Eagle, and he is our Father Creator Spirit. And everything that we see, look, use to rely on to support our lives for Aboriginal people was given to him by us. And what he gave to us was his other partner, which is his wife, if you like, and that is the earth on which we stand on, the spirit of our mother. The spirit of our mother is becoming sick and some parts of our mother, the threatened species that you've been hearing about today and other threatened species are suffering more than some of the other species which you might see quite commonly, which of course is the wombat and the kangaroo. And we all know about the brush-tailed possum. Everyone's been in a house where you've got one living in your roof and they have learned to adapt to the land but they are still declining in numbers and it is up to us not just us adults not just you children not just the government it is up to us to all work together to actually make sure that we maintain and create spaces for those animals to live in just because we might want to use that water Every time you walk out into a park or you walk through the bush and you want to run and you want to climb trees and you should be able to do that. But every time you climb a tree, remembering what might you be doing that might be damaging nature. Every time you go for a swim, every time you leave your rubbish behind, every time you light a campfire, 
you need to think about all these things that when you leave it, what have you left behind? What have you protected? And what have you actually potentially may have had an impact on? I'm looking now at this big old tree that came down. And when we talk about the pygmy possum, and the possums I know about actually need hollows that live in trees. Now, this is a beautiful old tree that I'm looking at. I can't tell you how tall it is. It's about one and a half meters in diameter. And it's fallen down now. And it was probably about 20 meters high. A fascinating old tree. And now that it's down on the ground, we can actually start to look at it and see what role it played in nature. For one, of course, it's a very, very big tree and it provided shade for us as human beings. But it also provided shade for other animals that live down on the ground in the grasses. And there are tracks, and we talk about tracks through those, uh, underneath those rocks for the, uh, for the mountain pygmy possum. There are tracks in the grasses too that animals need to use. And this one here, I haven't identified what animals use in this, but it was more than likely the kangaroos and wallabies that live on this ground. But also we have pests as well. We have the deer. Now the deer are a beautiful creature and nobody wants to hurt them, but they do a lot of damage to the environment. So you actually need to start thinking about what we do have in the landscape, even though they've been here for a long time and they may look beautiful, but are they a threat? And how do we damage the threat? Foxes and cats in an urban environment, if you are living in an urban environment, are probably the worst threat that we have. Cats in particular, uh, when you're living in housing estates. So it's a matter about, I will say, and I'm a cat lover myself, but we should be, if you uh, have cats, that you do lock them up at night time. Also make sure that they are well fed so they do not want to go out and hunt. And you can train cats to do that. It's very hard to train a cat. You can train a dog, but it's very hard to train a cat. But dogs make their own impact in the landscape as well, especially when you walk them through the parks. And if you don't pick up their poo afterwards, that poo breaks down into the ground, gets into the waterways and can affect the waterways and do all sorts of damage. Just like our wastewater, the chemicals that are used to deal with the problems we have today. But really what I want to talk to you about is the beauty of the bush as it is today is not the same as the beauty as what it was before white people came to Australia. But what I found out, which I could not see when this tree was up in the air, is that this tree, even though it's fallen down, still has a purpose. And we need to protect some of these things that are actually a useful tool, not only for Aboriginal people in their culture, but there are animals that will still live in this tree for many, 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 many years. Maybe not the same animals because it's not in its position. But as I've found out yesterday, and I'm gonna go down very close to it now. If you look inside here, there is a hollow. Now it's different to the hollow that is starting to form at the other end where the tree has broke when it hit the ground. And it might not be easy to see on this camera. But the inside of this starting out over toe, over this length of tree, for other animals to actually use it. And it may still happen. I can't tell you what animal lived in this tree, but it was quite large. And it was more than likely birds, cockatoo, gangangs, potentially lorikeets. Now that he's laying down, they might abandon it. But as it starts to rot away from the inside, and breaks down and goes back into the soil and creates all sorts of other things that help the soil to happen. It can become an important habitat. So when you go out in the bush and you, and you see people out there clearing it up or cutting it down and using it for firewood, and yes, we do need firewood and Aboriginal people use firewood for thousands and thousands of years before we had gas and electricity and so did Europeans or whatever country you might've come from. 
But it's important to remember that not everything is there just for us to use. So Aboriginal culture is not about looking at the land and what we can get out of it. It is about understanding the land, who uses it. When we talk about the mountain pygmy possum relying on the bogon moth, many of our tribes here in Victoria would actually gather, and we still do it today, although we don't eat as many bogon moths, but we would have a bogon moth festival. And we would share, and there was enough numbers of moths now for us Aboriginal people to share, pay respects to the mountain pygmy possum, and understand that we needed to leave some behind for those animals to survive. These are the things that we need to think about. No matter where you walk, it's the things that you can't see, and you, and it will be very, very rare that you will be able to see a pygmy possum in the natural environment, unless you go out there with special nighttime cameras at the right time of the year. So sometimes when you're walking around the bush and you may think you know everything that is there, it's not until you walk around of a night time, what we call walking country and using all of those five senses to look at what you see, listen to what you hear, touch what you can feel, taste what you can eat, understanding all of what happens on country is not just one single thing. It is a circle of knowledge and using science and Aboriginal cultural knowledge because we were the first scientists of this country and we've observed it. And scientists, the modern scientists that come out of universities and now work at museums and work at sanctuaries are starting to understand that we have knowledge. The one thing we are, everyone is starting to learn that also you children are the best observers that we could ever actually have. So it's important when you're walking out in the bush to take your camera with you or a notebook, write down what you see, take it to your parents, to your teachers, or to whoever else you have in contact with and say, I observe this, but what does it mean? And if they don't know, and look, adults don't know everything, but they can actually help you get in touch with a specialist they can teach you what you have learnt, what its place is within the ecosystem, within the environment, and you young people today will be the ones that lead the government decisions of tomorrow to make sure that it becomes much, much easier to preserve those threatened species, but to make sure that we maintain the populations of all the animals, plants, fish, reptiles, mammals, I already said mammals, didn't I? But also the insects, the snakes, the spiders, all the things that we're all afraid of, all the, uh, the bees, our native bees, our native wasps, the insects that live under the ground, that make our soils healthy, that make our trees grow, that help us to breathe. So much of it is all connected and it's going to be something that we're going to hand down to you. Now, normally in my age, we weren't given this responsibility until we're in our 20s. We realise now that we need to pass this knowledge down to you now, while you are children, so that you remember it and carry that on into the future, so that we can all live in this beautiful country that we call Australia, not just as humans, but we learn how to share it equally with all the animals all the birds, all the fish, all the insects, make sure that they are important because they are the ones who have better connection with nature than us as humans ever will. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Molly. I'm 13 years old and in year nine. My mum works for Trust for Nature and I've loved nature my whole life. I'd like to give a huge thank you to Uncle Dave for speaking to us. It was so interesting. In particular, I loved the story about you fishing with your father when you were younger. It really put everything into perspective. Thanks to everyone today for listening in. Our planet is and will be our only home for a very, very long time. And yep. it's so important that we protect it. That's why it's such an honour to have three knowledgeable and engaging speakers join us today. I'd like to thank Bridget from the Melbourne Museum, Rebecca from Zoos Victoria and Uncle Dave for talking. 
I think I speak for everyone when I say we all learned so much. If you're just as inspired as me after listening to the speakers and are wondering how you can help nature, spread the word. Talk to your teachers, talk to your friends, talk to your family about how important preserving the environment really is. Just spreading awareness can make a huge change. There's also an Aussie backyard bird count on the 19th to 25th of October. So look that up and take part on www.aussiebirdcount.org.au. Most importantly, you need to appreciate and experience nature in order to protect it. So get outdoors and immerse yourself in it. We're now going to answer a few questions that have been sent in by everyone watching at home. So starting with Bridget, where near Melbourne do growling grass frogs live? Hey, uh, great question. Um, if you could give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, Molly. Awesome. Okay, so if you have any creeks near your house or any waterways, they're found in a lot of Melbourne waterways. Um, so you can even go out at night is mainly, and it's like sunset, mainly when you can hear the calls. And um, there's lots of apps out now that you can record frog calls and send them in and you can get the species results. So if you're not sure if you're hearing a growling grass frog or not, you can use your phone. Um, and there's lots of different apps out there to do that. Um, so yeah, just go out exploring, like you said, and um, yeah, frogs are most vocal. I guess the easiest way to um, know if you've got frogs around is to hear them. So yeah, they're most vocal kind of at sunset and at night. So that way you can kind of tell if you've got um, frogs around. <laughs> Thank you, that was such a good answer. So for Rebecca, are pygmy possums related to mice? Yes, I noticed a lot of those questions coming through the Q&A. Um, they're actually not related to mice. They do look really similar, but they're actually more closely related to kangaroos and wombats because they're marsupials and have a pouch. But saying that in 1966, they were thought to be extinct. And um, someone at a ski lodge at Mount Hotham saw one running across the bench in a ski lodge and thought it was a mouse, only to discover that it was actually a mountain pygmy possum and they weren't extinct. So they have been confused with mice for quite a few years. They do have many similar features, but because of that pouch and their marsupials, they're actually more closely related to um, koalas, kangaroos and wombats. Thanks, I was confused about that too. So thank you for clearing that up. And finally, for Uncle Dave, could you please tell us all an Aboriginal word? One Aboriginal word. Well, I think the most important one is Wamindjika. Well, hang on. i got, got to start my video, apparently. There you go. It's still not looking at me. I'll just turn the camera back around. Of course, there is much that has been lost in our language. I'll give you one important word. So we heard about the possum today. Now, my brother, who's no longer with us, he was given the name frog by my father because he liked to play in the water. I was given the name possum because I like to climb trees. Now, we have a name for one of our possums that I know the Aboriginal language from. He's also one of our totems. And he's probably the most common possum that you will come across and that is the brush-tailed possum. And his name is Tadjuri. Now, I know that the word is broken up into two parts, and Tadjuri is very much the same as Wurundjeri of the tribe that I am from. Now, Wurundjeri, the name of our tribe, actually comes from this tree that I'm looking at now. Uh, turn the camera around, here it is, and it's fallen down, another one that fell down in the storm, and that is the Managum. So Warren means manan, manna, and Jerry is the grub that lives under the bark of the tree. Now Tad in Wurrung language means the possum, and Jerry is the food that he actually eats. So he likes to eat the grubs that live underneath the bark of the tree. Now, of course, there are many, many other words, and I can talk for hours about it, uh, but I need to be actually looking at things that remind me of that. But hopefully that's enough. But the one thing I think we should all remember, and it was said at the start in the acknowledgement, and that's fantastic acknowledgement, is Waminjika, which means welcome. So no matter who you come across, when you go out, when you leave your house in the morning and you walk out into the bush, 
just say Waminjika because if you pay respects to the bush and to the land you live on, it will welcome you as well. And it will know that when you ask for Waminjika for welcome, that it will also look after you while you are out there on country. I hope that's enough. Thanks, Uncle Dave. That was awesome. So on behalf of all of Trust for Nature, I would like to give a huge thank you to Reggie Marritt, who's listening today. He's eight years old and he raised $3,000 for Trust for Nature by growing his hair. So a special shout out and thank you to him. I'd also like to say thank you and give a shout out to the amazing schools that have tuned in today, including Brunswick Northwest Primary School, Auburn South Primary School, Coburg North Primary, Eltham Preschool, Caulfield Primary School, Ararat 800 Primary School and Ararat College. We also have a very special school tuning in all the way from Bali, so shout out to Green School. We hope you enjoyed it and a huge thanks to the other hosts, Summer, Benji and Hugo. You were all amazing. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. 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 Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.